The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Kev, I need to share something that's very important with you for your Spanish. Um, you are going to Spain this year, aren't you? Uh, yes. Good. Yes. Good. I just all, all good. That. All good. All systems go. Check that before I, I, I say this. So when you go to Spain, of course, everything may have changed by then um, in terms of, of getting back into the country. But I did find that I was a little bit missing on the paperwork that I needed to get back to my own mother country. And I almost didn't get here, Kev. I mean, you know that I flew the day that British Airways decided to uh, uh, decided their computer. Well, decided to reboot their computers. I think IT <laughs> went IT went home for the day, didn't they? Yeah. Well, I messaged you, didn't I? So I'm not flying BA today, and you went, uh, "Yeah, I am." <laughs> you were at a wedding, and I said, "Kev's just sent me a message to Sam," and she said, "Oh no, he's just frightening you." <laughs> and I said, "No, look at the news story," and uh, she went a bit ashen with that, but. Um, <laughs> You need you need to fill out. It's called Verify. Have you heard of Verify? No. Okay. Well, you need to fill out some sort of documentation with the government to tell them where you're going to be when you come back, and so on and so forth. And and whilst we were away, I said, "Oh, I don't need to fill that out. They'll let us back in." Oh no, they won't. Mm. I we we had to get the laptop out and everything. We held up the queue. I could see the the daggers that were in the back of my. So make make sure. Kev, you do your very yeah. fly. The other thing, when I went... That's a COVID for, thing, right? That is a COVID thing. So who knows by, by when you come back in, what is it, August, September, late August. Maybe it's not, no, won't even be a thing. But the other thing, when I went through, and you know you go through the uh, the bit where they test your bag, blip, blip, and have a look at it and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. They found my dead cat. <laughs> <laughs> Poor cat. <laughs> and the guy, the guy said to me, he said, what is this? And I said, um, instead of saying it's a fluffy thing that fits on the end of a microphone to stop it popping, I said, it's a dead cat. <laughs> <laughs> so you let you on with the dead cat? Yeah, let me on with the dead cat. And both legs are intact. The Fuji cast. And next time, Kev, I am taking you. I found, yeah. I found the perfect slope for us. It's gentle and it's got a hot chocolate bar at the end. <laughs> so there's none of that awkwardness about having to do apprey ski with big beers. You'll love it, Kev. You'll love it. I would. Why don't I we do it, Kev? It. We should do it. That should be next year's Fuji Cast adventure. Should be um, skiing. Kev, Kev and Neil go skiing. Yeah, I'd love it. It's been a long time since I stuck sticks in the bottom of my feet. <laughs> do you think you'd be? A, do you, would you snowplow all the way down screaming to start with? No, <laughs> no. A skiing's like riding a bike, isn't it? Once you can do it, what? you can do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can't. You necessarily do it as fluidly, but yeah, you don't. You don't regress right back to the beginning. No, I that's don't. that's true. Although they do say, and I think this is true, you spend the first couple of days sort of trying to maintain some kind of dignity. Um, and it's really the third day where everything sort of comes back to you. So by by the Wednesday, Kev, you'd be all right. <laughs> you'd be. I've been watching them do the um, the uh, the jumping in uh, Lillehammer. Um, they're doing the world championship jumping there. That is oh extraordinarily brave to do that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, dear. I love that. Right, well, welcome to the Fuji cast. We have uh, an announcement to make today. Me and Kev are getting married. Du -du -du. No, it's too late for that. You got married to Gemma last year. Twice. Twice, I know, twice. Um, we do have an announcement to uh, to come. Um, we have a guest, part two of Charles Brooks, talking to us about being in... Well, it's like Honey Shrunk, the uh, photographer, isn't it? Being inside those, those instruments. They're quite incredible, aren't they? Those pictures. Oh, amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, this, this. He's inspired me to start taking pictures of Hang musical on. instruments. Not at, not inside, just outside. I was thinking, are you, are you getting a probe microphone, Kev? A microphone? Sorry, um, a probe... Um, oh, not microphone. No, pro, 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 I thought you said pro microphone. No, probe and camera. And actually you probe, said probe. Probe, probe camera. No, I'm not. Probe lens. lens I do quite like the idea of uh, setting up the, the studio and taking some nice pictures of my cheap guitars and my clarinet and stuff like that just to see what they look like. Are you still noodling all the time? Yeah. yeah. Noodle, noodle, noodle. Are you doing it's anything else? It's a great else? way of getting the living room to myself. Is it? <laughs> Chases just them pick off. it up. Even the dogs leave. <laughs> <laughs> Did every, any of your kids ever say, did Albie or Rosa ever say, Dad, can I take up the violin? 
<laughs> oh no, 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 no. Actually, Albie, Albie's pretty good. He, he quite, uh, you know, he tries to guess the tunes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I've given him, I had somebody gifted me a, uh, a little ele- electric guitar before Christmas. So I've given that to Albie and he's got that in his bedroom now. Oh. So he's he's going to try and uh, try and start noodling as well, much to Gemma's <laughs> Deep you could have one of those bands, Kev. One of those family bands. You like the Jackson Five? Well, the too. well, may, maybe the Jackson Five. But I, I was thinking of the, all those bands, those bands that formed during COVID. You know, we get all the families that that started mm. <laughs> entertaining the world with. Uh, ev- everybody would be on something, you know. Yeah, Dad yeah. would be on Triangle. <laughs> just to try and keep up with the family <laughs> and uh oh god all those um what are those the things we used to play at school the whistles what are they recorders oh god. oh <laughs> recorders I, you know what the recorder uh i was reading a really interesting article about the recorder probably one of the most versatile musical instruments you'll ever find really believe it or not yeah from kind of pitch and tone and abilities and all that kind of stuff if you're if you're anything other than really good at it it just oh. sounds er- horrible doesn't it <laughs> Well, it does sound a bit squeaky. Sounds like a teenager that's trying to find the uh, the depth in his voice. You can get some like really nice like baritone record uh, recorders and stuff, and they're they're deeper and they sound beautiful. I have to say, if you know what you're doing with them. I've got the baritone here. Uh, try this one. Oh. Yeah, yeah. C yeah. C major. <laughs> <laughs> right then, questions. Um, questions. Oh, we got some bumps to the fronts. Oh before, yes. Before. So uh you have those. Do you have those? I do. Um right. so some of them are comments. Uh, Keith Martin, you should feel rightly very proud of Fujicast and the community that's formed around it. I look forward to supporting and seeing where it goes next. There's a kind of a clue to some news we've got. Uh Richard Yarp, it makes perfect sense. I look forward to listening to the new version. See. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, we'll save that for a second. And Stephen Anker though, with a question. Hi Neil, hi Kev. I wanted to ask your views on the arms race of photography. Careful. Whilst I fully accept that you cannot halt the march of tech, I do feel that constant thrust for more pixels, faster focus, um, etc., risks devaluing past photography and de-skilling current photographers. Do we risk discouraging potential talent who feel it's pointless to try unless they can afford the very latest kit? I think there's another part to the question as well. What about that to start with? Do you, do you think we're going to de? Do you think we will de-skill photographers with the, with the more stuff we we give them? That's the more autopilot we give them, the less skilled they're skilled they're going to be. Yeah. Well. Uh, well. Firstly, for those that don't know what bump to the fronts are, they are um, our patrons. So if you support some patron, you get bump to the front questions, bump to the front yeah. plus other bits and pieces. Yeah. So I've got two two strands of uh, opinion on this. Yeah. One of them is, if you think about the companies, there is definitely a school of thought that says, you know, why do they keep making them bigger and better and faster? And, you know, that does devalue it and everything, blah, blah, blah. But if they didn't, they would go out of business well, because they, they, they need yeah. to, you know, they need to, uh, in, in, what's the word? Not invigorate. Uh, Come on, Rodney, help me out. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Where's Kev's? Monge two. Monge two. They need to monge two. Monge two. <laughs> they need two. to they get need, better and they, bigger yeah, and everything to keep the, the the coffers going. So it's yeah. always going to happen, right? So no, no, don't let's not think that uh, you know there's going to be a company that comes along and you know creates the perfect camera and then just goes, yeah, there we go, yeah. knock your socks off because yeah. uh, they've got a business pretty quick. Um, but yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, I, you, we've seen it. We've definitely seen it in the wedding photography world, where you know there are photographers that basically turn up take twenty thousand pictures and then cherry pick the good ones of which there will be lots and lots of good ones yeah. and that's purely based on the technological advances that have come their way that's not to say they're doing anything wrong or right but it's technology that has enabled them to do that that way there's absolutely no way if you go back well even if you went back five years 10 15 certainly that you could shoot the way that uh people shoot these days yeah. uh, in terms of weddings and things like that I think that it does give us opportunities. It does, uh, it does give for, you know, if you look at sports photography where, you know, that in- incredible frames per second that some of the cameras are kicking out these days, that's given us images that we would never have been able to get, you know, high speed macro photography, for example, you know, you take a look at those poor, uh, the ch- not chaffinches, well, the little blue birds that fly around above rivers. Pointy noses. Kingfisher. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So all those poor kingfishers who are being baited into boxes and, you know, you get all those amazing pictures that I think are awful, by the way. But if you, uh, you, you, the technology 
for you know with that high speed sync that high frames per second with high speed sync flash just wasn't there before so you'd never have those pictures you know and and it's hard for us to think well where do they go next but i think it was thomas edison that said you know sacked all his staff in like 1921 and said nothing left to invent go home everything's <laughs> been invented and uh, you know so you know we will be we will in in 20 30 years time we will still be plowing on and who knows how that technology will move but yeah i mean well, does it affect I don't think it affects artistic style because, um, you know, it's it's from a photography point of view, it's still that single frame. Um, you know, you put that single frame, I posted a single frame on Instagram yesterday that was from a wedding from 2011, um, you know, and got loads of, loads of likes and everything on Instagram. And it was one I totally, totally forgot about. And that was shot on a Canon 40D, I think which, you know, or 30D or something, wasn't even a professional camera uh, at the time. But that image itself is still nice, according to other people. And, you know, you don't, you can't legislate for that single image, I don't think. Well, I suppose our conversation with Charles Brooks today is about that march of technology, isn't it? I mean, that probe lens he uses to make these mm. incredible pictures is all part of the advancement of technology. And without it, he wouldn't be making those extraordinary pictures that we're, we're talking about again today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, expect, expect more. <laughs> basically yeah. expect more how long, expect do you think it take, how long do you think it takes somebody to color wedding where they've shot twenty thousand frames kev oh i, I <laughs> could i could not <laughs> even begin to think about it and yeah. i know i know many people that do that do i do yeah and, and some some that uh you know it, it take two or three photographers and they all take twenty thousand shots good god whatever whatever works it's not a you know i just couldn't do it i, I just couldn't I, I couldn't do it the hourly rate oh <sighs> I uh, just, I mean, there's, I think we've had several questions. One of them might come up today, but we've had several questions about outsourcing, yeah. editing, and a lot of people outsource their culling as well. I kind of understand outsourcing editing, but outsourcing culling, I think for me is a, a little bit disingenuous because I feel like essentially you're, you know, if you're taking 20,000 pictures at a wedding and you're outsourcing the culling and the editing, you're just the, the clicker of the button, aren't you, at that point? Yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I couldn't ever, I couldn't see myself relinquishing the, the culling. That's the bit where you think that's that that was your vision. That was what you saw. Exactly. That's, the, that's the reason why when you talk to, in this case, wedding uh, wedding couples, where you say, L let me be your eyes for the day. You're hardly their eyes if you're, if you're giving those eyes to somebody else who decides what you saw. There's even AI culling software now. What? Um, yeah, you can get AI culling software. And I can't... There, there's loads of them out there. It's it's become a thing, um, and and I know people that use those as well. well and I'm like, Ooh, that's new on me. I've not heard they of that. Seem to do a reasonably good job, I have to say. But again, yeah, I'm all for saving time and everything. But I don't know, like AI culling. Hmm. I think what it ultimately does is it just goes through every picture and makes sure that you know what it thinks is because you know it. If you think about the technology, talking about technology still, if you think about uh, Photoshop, right, and the new AI tools, and in fact, they're in Lightroom as well, yeah. you can do select subject, and it uses AI to select the, the primary subject, and it is, it is really very, very, very good. And so AI, there's AI algorithms out there that will do that. So the AI software, essentially what it does is it goes through every picture, it does select subject, uses AI for that, and if it can't, if it doesn't find a subject, or it, uh, you know, when it does find it, it uses AI to say, is it in focus? Yeah. And then if it's not in focus, it rejects it, moves on to the next one, next, 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 next. So essentially you're getting images back that are in focus and have a primary subject in the frame. And even you can even go as far as saying only return pictures where people are smiling that kind of stuff you, you know, know there, and in photoshop you can yeah, add smiles <laughs> yeah there's many images that, that i i show that um, are slightly out of focus is you know the point wasn't the it's that great debate isn't it of uh of is is it emotion or is it in focus yeah so, exactly yeah. but ten, you know technology is with you know it will be uh it's not just cameras i suppose is what i'm saying it's yeah. it, it's everything you know uh, where do you draw the line you you know you 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 got a more comfortable car to take you to your wedding job or your your commercial job you know, everything gets better and nicer and quicker and faster and more expensive and all that kind of stuff. Not that I can afford to drive my car at the minute with petrol prices, but there you well, go. Well, I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've decided, Kev, to keep to keep the uh, the current car now for the next six, seven years, however many years, Kev. New cars are a 
New cars are a thing of the past. Same here. Yeah. Same here. Um, there was a second part to that. Kevin recently referred to I suppose it's kind of tied up in the in the first. Recently referred to sports photographers using 40 frames a second and pinpoint accuracy. I look back at the photos of my wedding taken by a pro in 2007 with a 12 megapixel Watsits Nikon. They still look great to me. Some of the classic press sports photos are still brilliant. So how much stress should we put on the image in the moment and how much on the technical perfection? We've kind of answered that now, but uh, good points. Yeah. Good points. Thank yeah. you, Steve Anker, who is at SA underscore photos. Right, yours, Kev, from, from the Facebook group. Okay, yeah. Thank you, by the way, for... Uh, we did put a call out, obviously, for questions yeah. um, in the uh, last but one episode, and we've had a load, they which flooded, is great. They flooded in, they did. Yeah, well yeah. done. Well done, Fujifam. Yeah. Um, actually, hate that term, Fujifam. Fuji, I was going to oh, say, Kev, that's very unlike you. I know. I don't know why I said it. Fans! Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Have you turned <laughs> into an influencer? I'm gonna start. Uh, Where are my fans? Where are my fans? I'm gonna. I'm gonna start. Uh, Fuji fam. I said. Oh, not fam. fam! I thought you said fam, fam as in family. Oh, Good fam. God, no! Oh my word! You've got even more influencer I, type. I I hate the word fans. Like because fan, you know what fan is short for, right? You when they say football fan, well, fan, you know fan. football fanatic, I suppose. Fanatic, yeah, yeah, that's right. And fanatic to me is like that's not. I'm not a football fanatic. Not healthy. I'm a football supporter. Well, you might be rugby fanatic. No, I'm a rugby supporter. Fanatic, in my mind, conjures up your entire life is dedicated to it and, you know, you don't do anything else other than that, you know, and yeah. So no, fam, I said family, fam. as in Fuji fam, but even that. Fanatic, a person filled with excessive and single-minded zeal, especially for an extreme religious or political cause. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you've got f uh, religious and political fanatics, yeah, but I mean, then you've you got, can, you, you know, sports, sport fanatics, sport fanatic, camera fanatics, yes. car fanatics, yes. nothing extreme about liking cars, is there? <laughs> so uh if you're uh, awesome to you you're, you're awesome is my fanatic your fanatic yeah i get that <laughs> so jeremy baker says hi nnk nnk there we go we're nnk now right. um focus peeking on an x pro 3 uh it does it but forgets what it's been told or set up to do maybe because it flip-flops between i love that term flip-flops between being a webcam uh we had one of the guys talk about rugby we used to have a, a guy who played rugby with us his nickname was flip-flop um why don't ask it. Between uh, a webcam. <laughs> Maybe it's because it flip-flops between being a webcam uh, on continuous focus, multi infotemetry settings to manual and spot when I use it for stills. But still, help, please, as I don't believe it's a unique customer dissatisfier, a.k.a. a bug. Right. So the question there is focus peaking on an X Pro 3. It does it, but forgets what it's been told. Right. Right. So with focus peaking, for those of you who don't know what focus peaking is, when you're in manual focus, you can switch on ma uh, focus peaking and you have yeah. these little you see either it, red or white colors, or blue. Yeah, blue. Well, what do you use? I, I use red. Um, seems to yeah, be I use red. red yeah. yeah. Uh, and red, by the way, if you're shooting black and white as I do, then red is the best one to use for sure. I'm not sure whether Jeremy is thinking about focus limiting or focus peak highlighting because the focus peak highlighting will move because the moment you it refocuses or the moment you manually focus, it will change because it's only ever going to be peaking at the point of focus. So assuming the focus changes either on a webcam or when you accidentally move the ring or when you focus somewhere else, then it will, it will not reset it. But there is this, uh, you can do focus locking. Um, it's got a proper name that I can't remember now, but where you can set it to uh, like a third of a meter, one meter, five meters, whatever you wish, in fact, or custom. Now, and that should stay within the range. I have, a, I don't really use that very often. In fact, I don't use it at all. In fact, I'm not even sure I've ever used it, but I've not seen any kind of complaints about it not working. So mm. I don't know whether there's a, a little bit of a mismatch in, in uh, what we're talking about here, but focus peek in. Yeah, I would expect that to change. I don't think that's a bug. I would expect it to to be in a different place. When I use focus peaking, I use it all the time at weddings, and I'm con you know the whole point is you're using it to see where the focus point is. Yeah. So it's it, it will it will change. I yeah. Think, I think the only time I really ever use it is in manual when it, when I'm making a film. That's the only time I think. Yeah, it's used a lot for filmmaking. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just uh, a, a lot, yeah. standard tool for for focusing, isn't it? And, Mm -hmm. in, in that respect um what would we uh, n n and k is that what we now etch onto trees don't do that kids you should never etch onto trees but you know what i mean 
Was it N plus K or N and K? Uh, it was N and percent K. All oh, right. Okay. N and K sitting on the tree. K I S I N G. Kev. Wade Brown, who is in Perth. I'm not going to say, have you been to? Good day, gents. I'm very much an amateur photographer shooting for fun, and I wanted to get your thoughts if somebody like myself would also be taking photos at a wedding you were working. I have a friend's wedding coming up. I thought I'd take along my X100V, take some snaps for fun and practice and memories and all the above. Would you want the bride or groom to ask you beforehand, or would you not mind if somebody else was there taking the snaps with a... Uh, professional camera and well there's a second question but let's go for the first first of all i i would say i'd be absolutely perfectly fine with it be just be aware of the the photographer don't don't i mean i remember and we've talked about this one before kev when i was filming you working at a wedding and there was a guy that was always 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 in in your shot um who sort of so i suppose appeared as the un- unofficial other photographer um, but he was completely unaware of you, Kev. And I'm, mm. I, I'm sure, I mean, you just kept photographing it because you were photographing it as a documentary event. If he was in the shot, he was in the shot. But mm-hmm. it, I just thought it wasn't. So that that's the thing that I would look out for. I, I, just keep an eye on where the other photographer is. It, and it is worth asking the bride and groom's uh, permission in this particular case because I, I have been uh, at weddings where, I'm just going to say Uncle Dave. I apologise. Um, I'm going to say Uncle Dave. Where Uncle Dave, he's exceptionally enthusiastic with, with his camera. And that's fine, because we all love photography. But he then drags the bride and groom off to go and do portraits, um, because he believes I'm not doing my part of the job properly. I'd and love think, that. I no, love it when that happens. This is, yeah, but it's not... It's not what they signed up for or necessarily wanted and you've sort of you've you've kind of with your size 12s just trodden upon the whole thing so yeah make yeah. your docu- make your documentary pictures but be aware just be aware and and be genuinely respectful of the photographer yeah yeah that's it i mean look there's no difference to be totally honest with you there's no difference taking your x100v or taking a phone yeah and taking pictures you know there's no difference so yeah just enjoy it don't get in the way of the professional photographer and just yeah yeah enjoy it but don't you know don't i do find sometimes i feel like some people are missing the wedding because they're they're concentrating on taking as guests they're concentrating so much on taking pictures and that that's fine you know but you know, don't miss the wedding. For, Just- for, for many people, though, that's actually a, um, a mental assistance in some respects, the camera. It gives them the opportunity to not necessarily hide behind something, but to have something to do. I've spoken to many people that say, oh, I'm not very good at mixing with, with people. I'm, you know, And here I am at a wedding with a 200 people. I'm finding the camera's giving me that opportunity to... Um, just, mm. just sort of be me without having to feel I've got to make small talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a second question here. A lot of the photos I take lean towards black and white rather than colour. Is this because it's easier to make an average photograph look better in black and white than it is in colour? Further to this, <laughs> do you go out shooting thinking the photos you're wanting to make on that day being uh, in black and white or in colour, or does it change when, when you're looking back later during the post-process, I suppose is what he's saying here. Much appreciated from Wade Brown in Perth. Um, you're chuckling there. <laughs> Well, he's right. I mean, let's you know, let's not let's not uh, wrap this up in cotton wool. Crap pictures can look better in black and white. <laughs> Throw heard, a bit of grain on it. You heard Perfect. it here. It's art. It becomes hang, art, doesn't hang, it? Hang on a moment. What the? F- <laughs> I don't believe Kev said that. Yeah, how many are like uh, every single person who's listening to this? I guarantee has turned a rubbish color picture into black and white and gone. Yeah, that'll do. Oh, uh, have, you a, have, about, have you done it? Have you done it? What about? Have you done it? Have you done it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like to believe it's done for the right creative and technical reasons too, though, Kev. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, yes, correct. But however, it, it will, it can work. You know, it can work. I mean, a, a really good, a good black and white will primarily, uh, the focus will be, not focus, but the um, uh, consideration will be primarily about the light because there's yeah. only two gradients essentially yeah. in there, you know, from black to white, effectively gray. And so if you have a good, a good light source or whatever that's coming from, artificial or otherwise, then then it will be a good black and white. If you have a, a, a very badly poorly lit, you know, let's just say it's, uh, I don't know, uh, head and shoulders shot of somebody in an office and there's no no real light and they've got you know rubbish light uh, you know drop lights above them and they've got shadows in their eyes oh, and all that kind awful. of stuff yeah, yeah. and it just looks awful in color and you convert it to black and white it's not going to make it a better picture but it will it will distract from some of the uh, deficiencies of that light perhaps yeah, yeah. Um, but you'll easily be able to tell because if the light isn't directional isn't good if you haven't got a solid white effectively um, leading to a black then that that's the, the sign of a good black and white in my mind is when you have a, a, a point of white and a point of black mm. it's not just grey all the way through it different tones of grey I wonder whether the uh, the uh, culling AI is going to be able to deal with it. only show me pictures that can be done in colour I don't have to turn into black and white setting I w- yeah that's right I wonder if the, the culling AI computers probably yeah. got a oh I can't be arsed with this I'm just going to turn it all into black and white mode <laughs> yeah, that's it <laughs> Probably. <laughs> right. Um, announcement. Oh, there is no time. Oh, Neil, that's like when you have a film and it goes to goes to the commercial break. Um, <laughs> now we're going to do this uh, after we've heard from our guest. Second part this week, Charles Brooks, who makes the, the, and you were absolutely right, Kev, most incredible pictures of the inside of, uh, of musical instruments. Here's part two of Charles Brooks. I feel almost um, that you may be disappointed with me for for, uh, pulling out one particular instrument, and you probably know the one I'm going to mention straight away because you've got these $300,000 pianos and these these cellos with enormous history, and I'm drawn to a didgeridoo. Um, (laughs) I I totally get it. That was was the shot that more than anything else blew my mind because, uh, you know... Whilst I haven't seen the inside of, of my own cello very much, I, I know what's in there. I know that there's, you know, how it's constructed. I was actually, uh, you know, when it came to photographing that, I was there to photograph something else. I was photographing a saxophone. Right. And the the client that I was working with said, oh, hey, I've, I've got this didgeridoo. Why don't we pop the lens in there and just see what it looks like? And I was expecting something, you know, maybe a, a sort of rough hewn surface that looked like it had been chiseled out or something like this. And, mm. and I thought, well, well, we'll give it a go. It might be interesting to see the tool marks. And then I'm suddenly presented with this extraordinary alien cave-like <laughs> landscape, yeah. um, this yeah. organic structure. And it turns out that proper didgeridoos they're carved out by termites. I know. I couldn't. It's extraordinary. That yeah. became the main. That became the main conversation at the meal table tonight. When I was able to say, "Hey, kids, did you know how didgeridoos are made? If they're real ones." Yeah. So you know, they will spend. I, I don't know how long it takes a, a, a you know Aboriginal to to find the right log of the right size of the right shape. I imagine it can't be easy. No. You know, cut it off, and then of course they they are doing extraordinary work on the outside you know, carving and painting and polishing yeah. these instruments. But that's something, that's what everybody sees. And I'd I'd certainly seen didgeridoos before. I, I studied in Australia. I'd played alongside them. But I had no idea about this this history of the inside of them. And so photographing that was, it's, it's something I'd love to do some more of because I know that every single one of these those instruments is going to be dramatically different just because of the, the organic way in that it's, it's you know, being constructed. They also have a, a, a sort of fable, uh, a, a history behind, a, a creation history behind didgeridoos. And the idea was that the first didgeridoo was, um, you know, taken from a tree and the guy who found it pointed it up and blew through it to get rid of the termites that are in it. And these termites are white. And he blew so hard that those termites flew up into the sky and became the stars. Became the stars. Oh. 
Um, uh-huh. And I, 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 I love astro photography. I know it's you another do. big I know passion you know, of mine. I'm, so I, I, was, I like that link in there. Yeah, I was about to say that they, the, the, the inside of the didgeridoo to me, knowing your astro photography now that I've seen it, there, there, there was something about the galaxy about it. In, if you look inside, you'll have to see the picture and we'll link to it. But it looks like it could be a part of the, or maybe I'm, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm being far-fetched, but it does look like it could be a, a part of our galaxy. Yeah, it, it, it's got that sort of red colour that you'd yeah. expect from a nebula, yeah. red and black and white. This yeah. is all stuff that, that we associate with astrophotography and, and that kind of spherical shape that that circular pattern that you see so much in nature um yeah it's a, it's a thrilling instrument to to yeah. photograph um i've i've since been in touch with a, a guy in new zealand here who has a collection of what we call taonga puoro which are ancient maori instruments those are, are created from sometimes shells, sometimes wood. And that'll be one of my next projects to go and photograph the inside of some of those, some of which are extremely ancient. Mm. And I'm, I'm particularly interested to see what the shell ones look like, because we should get some sort of light coming through the actual, you know, surface of it there. Um, the, the question is going to be, can I find a, a view that's long enough? Because they will spiral tightly in on each other yeah. whether i can turn that into a, an engaging enough photo i don't know but well, it, that's part of the excitement of this you, you don't really you know with some of these new instruments with some of these strange instruments you don't know if you're going to be able to find a successful angle um and so every every time it's a it's a thrill i, I expect with some of them i'm going to have to change up the equipment that i'm using so i'm already looking at, at different lenses Laua have have teased a prototype about six months ago, a very similar looking lens that shoots off at 90 degrees at the end. So it's like a little periscope. That is something that I could use. Um, I've tried to get in touch with them, but they haven't written back. So if anyone from Laua is listening, <laughs> um, if they, if we'll they, see. <laughs> surely they've seen your photographs. I, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, because also you're talking about, about shells and one of my questions, was going to be is there is there anything you can't photograph because it's just physically impossible to get the to get the lens in there and I, I would imagine that surgical lenses that can actually make their way around the body would would be the next step for you surely wouldn't they yeah so this is something I, i'm talking with a neurosurgeon at the moment about using and and trying out some prototype lenses yeah. um those particular lenses they do have a lot of limitations at the moment that would stop me from producing the kind of quality that quality, I want. Yeah. Because typically they're, they're made for video and they're fairly low resolution. Right. Um, so they might only be three, 400 pixels across and that's all they need for a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, and it, it's getting into just the, the properties of light there. I mean, you know, it's got to go all the way through this bendy fiber optic cable. The cable can only be so thick yeah. and there are there are issues with that the other thing is those have a fixed focus length so they are typically focusing within a centimeter of their lens and they they cannot actually change the focus out to infinity so you know you'd have to find a different way to do that sort of focus stacking that's so integral to the the effect of these photos of making these small spaces seem large you could do that by by physically moving the lens. And I'm, I'm considering that, but the issue with stacking those photos, especially on, on complex instruments like a piano or something, is um, you're gonna get all kinds of parallax mm. because we're not just talking about a tube. You you can see behind pieces, you've got strings going over the top, you've got bits of wood everywhere. And as you move through that, all of those are kind of you know going over the top of each other and being revealed and then hidden again. So stacking that would be a, a bit of a nightmare. Um, we'll we'll see what happens when I give it a go. Technology's got to catch up with you in this in, in this particular case. Um, I, in the same way that people want their portraits made, has anybody asked you to photograph the inside of their instrument as a portrait commission? I, I'm I'm wondering if you've got people with three hundred thousand dollar pianos just queuing down the street for you because it's so different and nobody else has done this before when people talk about having a usp 
You found one. <laughs> yes. Um, so that, that happened almost immediately. Right. Straight away. So not just people wanting portraits of their instruments, but wanting portraits inside their instruments. So them inside their instrument. Them inside their own oh, instruments. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so a little, bit of, a little bit of Photoshop going on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've done that once already. So I, I photographed a guy, a composer in... Uh, Hamilton, which is a town just south of Auckland, yes. uh, Michael Williams, and he likes to write for, for cello a lot. So um, he didn't have a particularly good instrument himself, but there's a, a luthier that I knew that was nearby um, who had a, a beautiful 200 year old instrument that um, so we went, we photographed the cello and then took him into a studio and it took a while to, to match up the lighting that was coming through the instrument to kind of recreate that on a larger scale in the studio and then also to get the perspective just right because you know obviously i i, ha I couldn't use the probe lens to shoot them in a studio i had to change lenses make sure i was mm. getting the right compression so that everything kind of looks like it's in the right space make sure the angle is is correct it took a long time but i, I think it worked particularly well so i've got a people love seem to particularly love it with cellos. Yeah. Um, so I've got a family that I'm, I'm looking to, to photograph soon. They've got a, a fascinating cello that was once hit by a train and then put Whoa. together. Whoa. And I'm, I'm, I'm really, I, I can't wait to, to get inside that and take a look. But I, I'm curious as to why anybody would try and put a cello back together after it had been hit, oh, by, a train. hit by a train. Yeah. But um, also just to see all the, all the repairs and so on. Um, so the idea is to have this family of musicians performing inside wow. their own instrument. Wow. Because part of the whole series, part of what, what really struck me with this is that these photos, they look architectural so I, I called it architecture in music yes. and they they look like a space they look like concert halls so it seems natural to want somebody to be in there playing i hope you don't mind but i, I want to sort of rewind a bit and talk about uh, mm. your your photography as a as a whole really um i, I think of you as a, as a very technically versed photographer clearly through our conversation but i also see so much creativity and and, and spirits particularly when i look at your portraits of people what, what what drives you? Is it the technical experience of doing something others haven't, as in these incredible pictures in the instruments? Or is it looking into a musician's eyes and making a very honest portrait? Um, so I think for the for the portraits of the musicians, it's it's really because I've seen a lot of boring portraits of musicians. Yeah. Um I've I've seen so many shots of of you know sit down, hold your instrument, nice lighting, plain yeah. studio, and, you know, here's someone. And I, I have a problem with that because, you know, the classical music industry has been in decline for a long time. Yeah. Um, it's tough to get the numbers at, at concerts that they used to get. Um, and, you know, I, I constantly come across people that, um, especially, you know, I'll meet someone that, doesn't listen to classical music and i'll tell them what i do i'll tell them what i photograph and they say oh classical music oh it's lovely it's so relaxing and i i just want to scream at them and say yes it's absolutely not relaxing there's maybe three pieces in a thousand years that i would consider relaxing um the rest of it is is tragic exciting um beautiful you know every other possible emotion except relaxing and I want to get that into people's portraits yeah. um, because the idea is, is these are going to be used on, on programs. These are going to be used on flyers all around the world. And, and you want, you know, these are often going to be someone's first um, sort of contact with a, with a, a new concert that's coming up. The first thing they're going to see is, is visual, not oral. Mm -hmm. And so I want to get some of the excitement of the music that these guys play, and it can be so exciting, into these portraits. So it's a matter of, of sometimes we'll have them levitating, sometimes we'll that. have their yeah. instruments look like they're on fire. Yeah. Um, all, all kinds of, you know, any technique I can to just get that drama into it so that people go, oh, this 
this looks interesting, this looks exciting, and then hopefully by that time there's another hook, a, a fragment of the music they can listen to and, and they're, they're sold and they're at the concert. Do, do the musicians um, 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 come in? Well, I mean, they're incredibly creative people, clearly. Do they come to you with the ideas or, or, or do they come to you knowing that you, you, want to, you want to inject the flair that you feel is missing otherwise? Usually they, they come to me and just say, do what you do. Yeah. Um, so typically I, I will ask them, you know, what repertoire do they usually play? Yeah. They'll send me a list of works that they're, they're known for or that they, they aspire to be known for. And I'll listen to those. And, and, you know, I was always a very visual person when I was playing music. So if I were playing a particular concerto, I would have a scene in my head for whatever was happening in that piece. And so I'll, I'll listen to that music and that will generally give me some kind of inspiration. I'm intrigued to say what's next. It sounds really to me, though, that there's an architecture in music seems to be at the, almost at the start in some respects because there's so much experimentation, so many new instruments, so much new technology to investigate, isn't there? Look, I mean, there's an endless supply of instruments and um you know not just classical western instruments there's all kinds of, of interesting foreign instruments all kind of wonderful asian instruments wonderful yeah. indian instruments yeah. um you know i could spend a lifetime photographing this and, and barely scratch the surface and that that's something i i expect i'll do yeah it's also a matter of continuing to evolve my, my photographic process. So I'm going to very rapidly reach the, the limits of what I can do with a rigid lens like this. I'm going to have to develop some, some new techniques. And I've got some of those that I'm, I'm working on at the moment to find, you know, different cameras, different lens properties that, that can get into ever more difficult spaces because the technical side of things always, always thrills me. I love that. And, um, you know, it's exciting to be able to, to work in that way. And you're selling prints. I did say I, I used a four-letter word right at the start of our conversation before we pressed the figurative big red button. I said, book! <laughs> uh, and, and you seemed a bit reticent. Well, I, I'm not really reticent. I do know how much work is involved in making a book, yeah. um, especially the writing side of it. But I think that, that most of these instruments have a story yes. and have a history so know, it's definitely that, yeah. something that could be done yes it's just a matter of of getting together enough of these photos to make something that's that's really good i need quite a few more but it is something that i i will do and yeah the the print side of things that that was unexpected yeah it's good. um it's it's been wonderful i've yeah. never i mean i've sold prints uh, you know i've i've sold you know every time i i do a commercial shoot my clients buy prints, but you know, this is typically people buying prints of themselves mm. or, you know, if it's, it might be printed for a political campaign or something like that, but, um, selling just sort of prints to, to, I guess, random people, <laughs> um, <laughs> was something I never expected to happen. It's certainly not on the scale that it has, you know, it, every time you go through these forums online and, and, um, there's always somebody asking, saying, hey, I wanted to get into photography. Where can I sell my prints? Um, how can I make money, you know, as a landscape photographer? And you'll immediately get 20 or 30 replies saying, nobody makes money selling prints. <laughs> um, it just doesn't happen. Um, and that that's what I thought. So I, I'd had a, a sort of print on demand service set up for for some other clients just because it was always difficult for me if the clients were overseas to you know find a printer over there or ship things from here without them being damaged um so i ended up using a company called gelato like the ice cream what? and they kind of they print everywhere they've got hundreds of printers and they they guarantee a certain quality um which seems to be very good so far i haven't had any issues and i had that set up for some other work i then i'd taken that cello photo so this is the the locky hill cello photo and i i posted it on reddit which is probably my my favorite place to to post photographs because you tend to get a lot of comments and a lot of feedback from people that are not photographers yeah. so it's not that yeah. kind of insular community it goes everywhere yes yeah. And that particular photo just just blew up and, and, you know, went right to the top of the front page and had thousands and thousands of comments and views. 
And I thought, oh, maybe maybe a couple of people might like to buy a print of it. Probably, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I just I put it up on the on the print shop and um, put a link back through it to one, you know, to my comment in, in Reddit that described the technical details of it. And then my phone just started going ding, 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 ding. It, it makes this little ka sound like a cash register. And um, <laughs> I've got to say that was a very satisfying day. Um, <laughs> so so I've done a complete 360 on, on, you know, can you make money selling prints? Absolutely. If, yeah. if you've got something, I think the key is to have something that's unique. And also, you know, these prints, I'm fairly certain they're almost all going to people who have played instruments and who are musicians, you know, people that already had a, a love of classical music. And obviously there was something untapped there that they, you know, that they wanted. Uh, thanks to Charles Brooks. And of course, on the shiny new website, fujicast.co.uk, you can find links to Charles and other topics talked about today. On Thursdays, that Mullins, he turns into country boyo, he does, a connoisseur of country music on an internet radio station called IncapableStaircase.com. And he's uh, now at the new time of 5.30pm UK time. Country boyo, a.k.a. Kev, will delve deep into classic and contemporary country, folk roots and acoustic music, taking trips down memory lane on the way. That's Kev, 5.30, IncapableStaircase.com, UK time, that is. And if you like your podcasts, I have uh, my photo walk show on a Friday on the podcast called Photography Daily, wherever you get your podcasts, as they say. We also have guests. Last couple of weeks, we've had Joel Marowitz. We all have the responsibility of being awakened to our potential. And it doesn't always come from inside. Sometimes somebody outside puts the key in your lock mm. and just turns it enough for you to catch a glimpse of possibility. Joel Marowitz on episode 283, and then last week with the ongoing situation in Ukraine. I talked with three photographers either based in Kiev or Lviv, including the war artist and photographer Mark Neville, who is now based in the country, having moved there a couple of years back. He's behind the work Stop Tanks With Books. What I don't understand, and I still don't understand if I could see it, and I'm not a political strategist, I'm just some 55-year-old bloke with a camera, if I could see it coming, then you can be damn sure that a lot of other people knew it was in the post as well. Fridays, wherever you get your podcasts, we're on our photo walk on the podcast called Photography Daily. Now, usually at this time I say... And back to your questions, but not today. Um, some news, Kev. We have news. Do, 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 That's my news jingle, Kev. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we've we've got an announcement to make um, about the show, Kev. You you did it so well just now. <laughs> I feel like I should hand the baton to you. Oh, okay, fair enough. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Were you waiting I'm for me to do it? No, you go first. You put the phone down first. No, you put the phone down first. <laughs> well, I mean, let's talk about well. Those in the Facebook group will already know this, of course. This is not new news at all. Um, mm. and, and our patrons, of course, will also know this. This is not new news at all. Um, but we're changing the frequency. Um, and I don't mean by that we're going from 99 FM to 102.4. We're talking about the um, the amount of times we do the, the podcast uh, to maintain quality as, as life gets busier, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. So um, those of you that have looked at the new website will will see there's a little bit of difference to it in terms of uh, the content and stuff that's on their pages, layers, all of that kind of stuff. And that got us thinking a little bit that, you know, that takes a bit of time and effort. And Neil spends a lot of time doing the editing of the show and the production and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, it just uh, during COVID, it was less of a challenge. But now that we are, uh, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully the world keeps spinning. We are getting back in the saddle with work and uh, you know, Neil's busier, I'm busier, everybody's busier. Um, so we've made the uh, unilateral decision to move the show to a monthly 
episode for first monday in the uh, in the month first monday of every month so then the we will actually have one more weekly so next week there will be another yeah. show yeah um thereafter there should be i don't know what it is two week break or something but the fourth of april weeks, will be the first of our uh monthly shows and um those of you that are in the patron will uh will have had this news as well and updates to your kind of contributions and what have you um but we will we're, we're planning on um making it slightly different but not overtly different no. and certainly not overtly long because we both we understand that there's a sweet spot for podcast lengths it's yeah. not going to be like a four-hour episode it's like, a bit like, 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 like the joe joe rogan of photography podcasts uh, he does, I, mean, I hate I joe he, rogan he, i'm honestly i like uh, my spotify system is now yeah. defunct of all of my Joni mitchell records and oh, neil young and everything oh. i'm gutted uh, yeah, they're all gone, really gone now me. because for a while they didn't go did they for a while i thought oh they might might remain i don't know i think it all did it was all like the publishing companies had to get involved in everything yeah. um you know and who stamped their feet the hardest anyway i'm sure they'll come back but uh yeah so we will we will we'll be redesigning the show a little bit nothing too much but yep. uh there'll be maybe some older features will come back in some new features well, will come books and coming back isn't it the books coming back books will come back Book and week. I'm going to head back to the studio with Neil and record it. So, I, uh, I, you know, I dusted off the other day your desk. Nobody has sat here since you were last here. Nobody. So mm. I dusted it down. I checked the microphone still worked because I and, and uh, I put the spotlight up again for you, so so you can bathe in in your in your spotlight. Uh, you get a glow off the top of my head now. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, things have changed in the two years. Um, <laughs> I had my hair cut yesterday again. My oh. my friend uh, Mehmet, the Turkish barber, and he was he patted me on the head again. No, like, no. One day, one day you come to Turkey with me. We sort this out. What? What does he mean by that? <laughs> he wants me to go to Turkey with him so he does can he? do a hair transplant on me. What? <laughs> No. Honestly, he's brilliant. Oh, I'm sure he wants you to go to Turkey for other reasons. Don't be rude. Oh, oh, <laughs> uh, one day we go. One day we sort this out. Tap, tap, tap. Uh, we're going to Turkey this uh, this year. Um, oh, nice. I hope. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so that's the that's the new show, and um, and and also we were talking about uh, because you're coming here, um, we might sometimes jet off somewhere to do some street photography or something and uh, because i know people used to uh, enjoy when when sometimes we had kevin neil adventures which will then be edited down and put into the show as well won't they exactly so yeah we'll it'll be it'll be fun i'm looking forward to it and uh it will it will also because you know one of the things that we had noticed and we we, we talked about offline off the show was uh you know question we, we are totally reliant on on you um boys and girls and ladies and thems to you know send us questions and and that's how the uh the show runs and we we appreciate every single one that comes through yeah. but we also do see um uh, lags and uh there are times when i we, you know people send in questions and there's times when people don't send in questions because you people are busy as well yeah and so this makes more sense because we can uh, we can answer the questions we'll fill the fill the question bag back up um we can do some more fun stuff as well when you and, say lags uh, do, do you mean uh, the the term used for Describing prisoners um, staying at Her Majesty's um, pleasure. That's what a lag, isn't it? Oh, lags. Yeah, lag. Lags. Yeah. I think there's an S in front of that word, isn't there? No. <laughs> I don't believe there is, Kev. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, anyway, um, so looking forward to it. Um, so we have another show next week, and then it's in, into month news. And there will be the occasional special as well. I, I sense Christmas time will be that. <laughs> Maybe when you go to Spain as well. Kev's midweek Spanish dip or something. I don't know. Kev yeah. doesn't actually move for a month. Uh, I don't. No, I turn into Salamander Kev. It's a, essentially it just, just lies on the sun lounger. I lie in the sun and I change colour. Do you even get up and go to bed? No. Uh, what's the point? The <laughs> point is that you've lying down all day. Might as well lie down all night. It's wasted time. <laughs> right um back to questions do you want to do a facebook one or shall i go from um from the uh, the email there's there's a good few here go for email then yeah go on All right, yeah then. so i'm gonna go for paul bartlett movies and marketing two questions firstly thank you so much for the kind words you had to say about my photography uh, when you read it read out my last question back in 2021 uh, which made my day and my week and possibly month 
I know Neil was quite inquisitive about my business name. Yes, last of the seventh. Do you remember it, Kev? Uh, mm. He says, which does have a meaning, but I'll save that for another time. You tease. Oh, so we still don't know what it means. No, I know. You can't do that to us. I have two questions, one quick and one a bit more in-depth. Firstly, with you both being photographers and connoisseurs of the well-composed and visually emotional, I was wondering what directors or movies, if any, you draw inspiration from or simply enjoy for their cinematic photographic qualities. Um, hmm. We've we've answered a question like this before. I mean, Stanley Kubrick always comes to mind. And that would be for cinematic and technical reasons as well, with the way that he uses um, lenses and only using one one focal length in his... Uh, in, I don't know about all of his movies, but certainly in some. Um, that that would be a reason. I'm trying to think of who was the guy that directed Brazil. Brazil! So I like these sort of really weird, weird only watch late at night on Channel 4 films. I'll but tell that, you, a great film that I watched cinematically was The Lighthouse. Terry Gilliam. Uh, Terry Gilliam was the name I was thinking of. Sorry, The Lighthouse. Yeah, Lighthouse, a couple of years that. ago. Tell me about it's, that. It's all black and white. Um, and it's about these two lighthouse keepers that go. Oh, and it's, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Was that black quite, and white only, was it? It's all black and white, oh, yeah. It's okay. great. I love that film. Uh, it's quite, Did, a, quite a convoluted, you know, you wouldn't want to watch it, you know, on a kind of Saturday morning. It's a, it's a late at night, you know, half a bottle of scotch kind of thing. Well, you, um, you can't do that anymore, Kev. That well, film's no, banned. It. That, it's banned from your house. I, um, yeah, it's a great film, that. You know, Is it, did, they, did they almost try and eat each other or something? Yeah, it gets very dark. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, and it gets very dark. But it's, it is, like, if, you, if we're talking about cinematic style, then that's, uh, you know, that that's a great, great one. And, you know, I, I, not films, but, you know, the art of, like, Edward Hopper and stuff like that, I yeah. really love as well. yeah. Uh, you can see, you can see inspiration. In fact, there's a great Facebook group actually called uh, Inspired by Edward Hopper. Oh, is there? Yeah. Um, and people put pictures up that they, you know, they kind of took because they were inspired by Edward Hopper. Some of them are absolutely incredible. Um, some of them are terrible, but, you know, some of them are amazing. So, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that kind of stuff. I love all of that. Mm, well, I like post, post, um, yeah, I, I'm going to wish I, I wish I hadn't gone into this. Post-apocalyptic. Oh, <laughs> post-apocalyptic is uh, is something that I, I don't know. I've seemed quite drawn to those sort of those sort of movies and the storyline and the direction behind it. And second part of the question here is a documentary photographer who's currently growing the wedding and the event side of uh, my business. I often find it hard to promote both aspects to potential customers. Although all my photography falls under a documentary style, promoting a book of street photography whilst also marketing myself for weddings, seems a little tricky. Do you think not zeroing in on one from a business point of view is harmful or helpful? Any advice would be appreciated. This is a sort of an old chestnut, really, this one, isn't it? But a good one, and, and one that I'm revisiting at the moment with the inexorable, onward, never-ending um, redesign of my website, which has to be done now because the old one doesn't work anymore. Well, it, you can see it, but you can't do anything with it. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm putting everything on there, Kev. It's mud against wall. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the days where websites are your primary, but they are you your know, shop window, my, though, Kev. I mean, they if, are your shop window, I mean, but you, I'm not sure whether these days they are your primary um, point of initial contact. I, mean, I it, think yeah. now that's places like Instagram. Do you? Yeah, wow. I think so. Um, well, the same uh, question could could then um, it could apply to that because yeah, if if your website, um, I mean, it's it's the old thing of talking about our commercial directors worried because they see a picture of uh, of people at a wedding. It was always considered that kind of oh, you shoot weddings, do you? Oh, oh I'm not sure about using you. Are you professional? That also exists when you put together your Instagram grid, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I wouldn't overthink it. I, I, you know, you you have to, if ultimately you want to do eighty percent weddings and twenty percent street photography, then make sure that your marketing, your website, your Instagram is eighty percent weddings, twenty percent street photography. Yeah, that's that's basically my my approach to it. Well, that's from Paul. Last of the seventh. Instagram at last of the seventh. Facebook at last of the seventh. Twitter. Guess what it is? At last of the sixth. <laughs> You're absolutely right. No, 
Destinations are fruitless. Feast on the journey, he says. There you mm. go. I will. Is that any clue to what The Last of the Seventh is all about? What is last That's a seventh? great byline, isn't it, in your email? Destinations are fruitless. Mine just says, many thanks, Kevin. <laughs> and you also put Country Boyo at the end of yours. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do do a link to my radio station, yeah. Country what, Boyo. <laughs> what do you think the, um, what do you think your, um, your commercial clients think of that? They obviously don't. Oh, they don't get it. They don't get that. Oh. I got a different uh, footer for them. <laughs> uh, oh, right. Okay. It's I'm exactly looking, the same. I just don't include that link. <laughs> I'm looking up last of the seventh here to see if it comes up online. Well, it, but there's nothing. Oh, there's the seventh man. Fury of the Seventh Sun, the Seventh Seal, the Seventh Doctor and Doctor Who. No clues. Well, he'll have to let us know. Please do. Uh, right. He will have to let us know. Um, I also, I've got something I must say, I for- totally forgot, I meant to say at the beginning of the show, was that we have our own Fujicast Stig, the Stig of Fujicast. What? Yes. So those who are in the Facebook group will um, uh, know that we did a thread where each month we're going to um, put a picture in. Everybody can put a picture in. And then the Stig will select the one they like the best. <laughs> and that will go onto a gallery page on the website, but also will become the banner image for the next month in the Facebook group. Kev, I know who the Stig is. How do you know who the Stig is? I do. I can tell you who it is. It's... Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, you're very clever. Very Whoa. clever. I worked it out. Yes. So um, if you, yeah, again, it's, uh, you, you. I suppose you could email us as well. But um, yeah, we will be, watch out for that on the website and the Facebook group as well. So yeah. um, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Interjection, because I've totally forgot what we're Are doing. people allowed to guess who the Stig is as they go along? They can guess as much as they wish. Uh, Dan O'Reilly says, hello, Kev. Hello, Neil. I am starting a large project, most of which will be environmental portraits in artist studios. Ooh, that sounds lush. Mm-hmm. Or places they work. I hate the word lush. I don't know why I said that. Or places they work. I have a 35mm F2 and a 15 to 45 kit lens. Do you think these would be good enough for portraits indoors? And if not, what lens would you recommend for these types of portraits? What, what were the lenses again? Sorry. 35 F2, 15 yeah. to 45 kit lens. I don't think either of those. Oh, well, they're, they're not typical focal lengths that I would use for... Portraits. 35 i think it well, depends how far back you get but yeah. you know it, oh they're like envi- you, uh, environmental portraits oh yeah. sorry yeah, yeah 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 well 35 does make sense then doesn't it not headshots as such no yeah and ultimately both of those lenses you know if you're adding light if you're throwing flash on them or using a constant source then doesn't really matter about the you know the the f stop if you like unless you're looking for a particularly sh- uh, shallow depth of field so you could use an f4 lens but yeah i mean 35 i think is absolutely fine just just make sure you've got control over the light because 35 is, well if it's so you've got the 35 f2 lens um you know you you're not going to be able to get down to 1.4 1.2 or f1 even um so make sure you've got your uh, available light, natural light, stick them in a window, that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think those lenses would be fine. Yeah. Um, here is one from Mathieu Chaveau. Um, two QQs from France. Um, hi, guys. Thank you for making our Mondays uh, much more enjoyable. Well, we'll make them much, 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 much. We'll have to be much, much, much more on, on the one Monday of the month, won't we? Yeah, three of your Mondays next month are going to be awful. <laughs> Throw. <laughs> you're going to have some rotten Mondays. Uh, Tell me why I don't like Mondays. Cue the song. Uh, QQs, feel free to answer just the first. Or, well, we'll do both. What am I talking about here? We'll do both. One, I'm on the market for a laptop to do my editing. Uh, What's your current on-the-go setup? The thought of biting into the Apple market makes me cringe, but the variety of Windows-operated laptops is just too damn scary. Thoughts? Well, I mean, you're talking to two people that use uh, two different systems. I don't know why the Apple one would make you cringe. I mean, the new M chip... Um, it's probably on about the price. Oh, uh, well, if it's the price, yeah, I get it. But if it's the chip, and I tell you what, this, I mean, they talk about a, a, a hot knife through butter. And I tell you what, 4K, editing 4K through the M1 chip, I mean, it just, um, it's incredible. But it is the money, isn't it, Kev? It's probably the money here. I mean, buy yeah, che- I buy, think that's probably what he's referring to. Buy cheap, yeah. buy, cheap buy twice, obviously, is, uh, is another is another phrase. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's not make this a, a Mac versus no. Windows thing, but no. the things to look for are, um, you know, you, you definitely want an SSD these days yep. and you want a reasonable amount of RAM, uh, 16, 32 gig at least. Um, but it, more importantly with the RAM is uh, the f- speed of the RAM. So RAM comes in megahertz 
often you'll get 2,666 megahertz RAM. But if you if you can find a laptop that gives you 3,000 megahertz RAM, then you're going to be doing yourself a, a huge favor. Yeah, they're ultimately the things. And if you are editing, as Neil just alluded to, uh, 4K, well, basically, if you're editing photography, you want a 4K screen, I would say. Yeah, well, uh, well, the HD size, and the size and the, me- the megawatts, it's... Um, with camera, we were talking earlier and earlier about uh, uh, earlier rather about cameras getting bigger and bigger with with regard to uh, the the sensor size, which is only ever going to slow things down when you edit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've got a Dell XPS fifteen mm. two thousand and nineteen. When did I buy it? When was the start of lockdown? Twenty twenty. Twenty third of March. Twenty twenty edition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is a new ver- there is a new version of it out now. Yeah. Uh, Dell XPS 15, which is beautiful. It's got zero bevel, so it actually looks like a 17 inch screen, but it's in a 15 inch body. Yeah, that's like I I edit my GFX 100 images on there with zero problems whatsoever yeah. in Lightroom. How yeah. long do you normally keep your your laptops? Are you well until they stop doing what they need to do, really? So what's um, that, two, three, four years? I think I had the previous one before that, the Surface Book, I had for probably three or four years. Yeah. I I am I you see what I tend to do is buy high grade stuff and keep them longer. So for example, my uh, Dell laptop has got 64 gig of RAM. Uh it's got a 8 gig graphics card built into it and I fully expect that to last me, you know, 4 or 5 years, maybe even longer. Yeah. My desktop studio machine here is uh, a, a monster machine in terms of specifications, so I fully expect that to last 6, 7, 8 years, hopefully. Um, you know, I'd rather I typically spend more at the at, at the at the forefront and then keep them longer. And that, top that, the, I'm top of the range, boy. I top think, of the range. I think that's empty wallet. When it when it comes to uh, the Mac price, I've I've always spent a lot of money on on Mac, but they've lasted a long, 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 long time. Well, that's it. I mean, you, you know, I did when I swapped my machine, my studio machine, because I, I previously had another machine that I'd had for a good six or seven years. Uh, and I went back and uh, looked at the price I paid for it. And of course, things were a lot cheaper then. I mean, God, you'd be lucky if you get a computer these days. Nothing is in stock, like nothing. Everything is out of stock. Yeah. Uh, I was on the Wex website the other day and everything is just a weight in stock, like from bags to to cameras, to lenses, everything, you, you know, and it's the same with PCs at the moment and computers and all that stuff. So, um, good luck in getting one, but the, one of the things, and they're a lot more expensive than they used to be, of course, but one of the things I did with that new, when I got the, uh, when I decommissioned the old computer was, and when I say decommissioned, I sold it to Steve Vaughan was I, uh, I divided the, how long I'd had it, um, by how much I paid for it yeah. and it, um, and in days and it worked out to be something like 17 pence a day <laughs> well, there we go because I thought it was reasonable I think Steve Vaughan's worth 17 pence a day <laughs> well maybe 15 but <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, um, well there we go you've, you've made your point with that and I think yes uh, invest in invest in that and uh, it's probably a good idea rather than skimping on the uh, it's difficult isn't it uh, otherwise you can the new always... Microsoft Surface stuff is looks beautiful it I've does. got a Surface yeah, yeah. tablet I never um, got on, I never got on with it and I, you know I tried but I just you did yeah and you had the same one as me and I, I did get on with it but, yeah. but you know mm. horses for courses but they mm. obviously that was I don't know what was that four or five years ago it was a long time Ago. Oh. They're changing now, but Microsoft are a little bit like Apple. So the Microsoft Surface stuff is very good, very beautiful, very quick, but probably more expensive than if you were to buy the similar spec from yes. like Dell or Alienware or actually Dell only Alienware now. Um, PC specialist, you could get a, you can, um, if you're in the UK, PC specialist will build you a bespoke laptop to your own specification yeah. um, custom build, and that will be cheaper than taking one off the shelf. So yeah, get a good one. Spend the money now um, and keep it for a long time. Yeah, I'm just looking online here to see uh, what the uh, what's available. Um, uh, oh, here we go, Kev. And this is reasonably cheap. You can get it through Prime. Get one tomorrow as well. No computers available, but there is an Etch a Sketch. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> do you remember? Do you remember Etch a Sketch? No batteries required either, Kev. That was the beauty <laughs> of them. Yeah, I used to love them. Shake them, shake them, and it all disappears. Make a beautiful picture. And in those days, you didn't even have cameras or anything to take a photo of the no. the, etch, the sketch. No, no. Yeah. Uh, oh could- no, it's insane. Like literally, if you typed into Google now something something to buy, it would just come up and say no res- no results. No, well, unless you want an extra sketch. 
You can't buy anything. No. Well, I don't know. What about the the um, the, uh, the uh, there must have been a run on Amazon Basics since you mentioned them so well <laughs> yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Uh, question two from uh, Ma- uh, Matthew, uh, which is: uh, I'm starting out as a documentary family photographer. I currently own an XE3 paired with a 23 f2 and 35 f2. Given my limited budget, would you suggest I get a second XE3? Safety in numbers, no lens swapping. Or trade the XE3 for a single X Pro 2, which has the safety and dual cards. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Mm. Would you go for an X Pro 2 with the dual cards, or would you would you have two XE3s with a 23 and 35? Now, usually I'd have said an X Pro 2 because I well, I always loved that. I, I regret selling my X Pro 2s, but um, I don't know. I'm I'm sort of I'm veering towards two XE3s here, Kev. <laughs> Uh, yes, probably. However, I would say that if you're charging, you do need to have one eye on, uh, and I mean charging money rather than charging batteries, you do need to have one eye on insurance. And, you know, my insurance companies these days do tend to insist on having re- data redundancy in your cameras. Yes, yeah. Um, so yeah, just you know, we shot for a very long time without dual cards. I know, so I know. it's not a, in my mind, it's not a, that much of an issue, but it is for peace of mind. And from an insurance point of view, it can be a thing. Um, I think we have time for a, uh, a quick, uh, do we have time for a QQ Kev? Or yeah. are we, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. It, it, it has to be a quick QQ then Kev. Okay. Um, Which is by definition right, uh, a QQ. Uh, Okay, I'm going to do one QQ and I'm going to do one um, uh, point. So Kian, Kian Balach, says, uh, um, he's, he does say it's a question, but it's not really. Basically, he's saying, have you seen John Shuttleworth's film? It's nice up, up north. It's nice up north. Um, and the answer is, no, I haven't. It's shop on Martin Pardo, and he features oh. in it a fair bit. Right. Um, so there we go. Nice up north. It's nice up north. I will research that, and maybe I'll, if there's a, um, a trailer to it, I will put it on the new shiny videos part of our website. Yes, we have got that. Because uh, yeah. we have got one, yeah. Um, so that's Kian has said that and then a question let's go to uh, Nanto Sealins uh, he says besides personal websites Instagram I'm curious to hear if either of you chaps or anyone else for that matter has considered embracing the great evil of Facebook and used it to publish personal projects as a blog oh there's an idea yeah he then goes on to say I hadn't really thought about it until my wife showed me a blog she's been obsessing over that follows oh. a caterpillar someone had <laughs> rescued uh, you can check it out if you want Eric the Caterpillar is a Amazing journey. The blog has gained over 10,000 subscribers in 13 days and really demonstrates the reach of Facebook. What's it called? Eric the Caterpillar's... Eric the Caterpillar's Amazing Journey. Right, why, I've what? just okay. clicked on it. Are you looking uh, up? It now has 11,004 followers. Oh, no, 12,321 followers. I can't there find it, go. Kev. I can't find it. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash Eric's Amazing Journey. Eric's Try that. Amazing Journey. Boom. Oh, yeah, there we go. In case you missed it, here's a rundown of Eric the Caterpillar, who is becoming pretty popular. I found him walking along on my veranda here in Binalog, New South Wales, Australia. I'm fr- they got the best names in Australia, haven't they? Binalong. Binalong, yeah. Binalong. <laughs> um, have you ever been along to Binalong? I've never, I looked been, him up. I lo- <laughs> yeah, I've never been along to Binalong. And we looked him up because he was super <laughs> cool and found out that he was a caterpillar of a tailed emperor butterfly. Oh, yeah. I named him Eric. Blah, blah. That goes on for a very long time. Anyway, yes. So this is a very good point, <laughs> Nate Nanto, because I do know of many, many um, businesses that uh, have their blogs on Facebook. Ah, yeah. Rather than. So the blog has disappeared from the website and it's transferred yeah. to just be a, just, just solely be a, a Facebook blog. Yeah. So your wow. Facebook page, we all, you know, we all had and still have Facebook pages, business pages yeah. that most yeah. of us have ignored for the last however many years. Yeah. And actually, the, uh, Facebook have changed those in quite a substantial way. So you can have sub pages, you can have kind of room, conversation rooms, all these kind of things now yeah. Yeah. On, on those uh, Facebook pages. They, they're, they're quite, in depth uh, and i do know businesses that use those very well for their, their their kind of interactions with people however what i would say is they do tend to be more of the lifestyle type stuff so right, you know the idea of the uh, um the caterpillar story yeah, for yeah, example yeah. it's fun it's it's a little bit of fun and it's beautiful and it's nice um you know it's a feel-good factor to it you know it's i'm not i don't think personally i would be switching my wedding photography blog to facebook because you know for example from a photography point of view facebook 
compresses the crap out of images and, also and all that kind of stuff. There's no search engine optimization to it at all, is there? No, but I think Nanto is pointing to the fact that Facebook has a billion zillion users already. Uh, you know, and uh, if you who aren't necessarily your clients, though. No, not necessarily your clients, but but could be. You know, I mean, when I share, I, I pretty much only share my Instagram posts onto onto my Facebook business page. Now I do it directly from uh, from Instagram. So I put yeah. something on Instagram and then I whack it on. Um, it automatically whacks itself onto Thingamajiggy. So I did one last night, 17 hours ago. I posted an image on Instagram and it's, I'm just looking at it now. It's squirted its way across to my Facebook business page. And on my Facebook business page, it's had 426 likes, 16 comments and four shares. So the Facebook business page, yes, there are many of them maybe photographers, but you know yeah. that that I that's a that's a very positive thing. You know, four hundred twenty six likes, sixteen is. comments, four shares, uh, and that's just uh, uh, you know that's just come directly from Instagram. I didn't do anything, so there is still power in Facebook business pages for sure. Mm. Um, I, I think so. Anyway, I think Eric the Caterpillar's amazing journeys also has a potential to be quite a sad one, really, because Eric's just turned into a butterfly, and and butterflies don't live that long. No, oh, twenty four hours, isn't it? Is that it then? Is is that Eric's journey over? Presume so. Oh, I don't know. That's that's taking the shine off it for me. Poor Eric the caterpillar. He might turn into a cake in Aldi's. <laughs> he could do and be uh, be at the head of a legal battle. <laughs> Oh, well, that's it for uh, for another week. We're back. We're back next Monday for the last of the the um, the weekly ones. Then after that, in April, it turns into our our monthly extravaganza with Kev here in the studio. I tell you what, Kev, you can you can try my new coffee machine. Ooh, Ooh yeah, yeah, sounds nice. It's posh um, with a capital P. Um, so we're going to be uh, in the studio. Uh, keep sending your questions in. So we're doing that the same way, aren't we? Um, that just continues. Mm-hmm. So send them into Facebook. Now, how, how Kev... Kev managed to find five ways the other day, and I couldn't work out. How did you get five ways of contacting the show? Facebook, questions for the, thro- the show thread. Uh, email, click up futurecast.co.uk. Go to the website, click on the contact form, fill that contact form. And quite a few people have been doing that, yeah. which is good. Um, you can write us a proper letter. Oh, that like was a letter. Yeah. Or you can become a patron, um, line our pockets with gold, and you are guaranteed to be bumped to the front. Or you can send a pigeon. There's number six. Yeah. Not a seagull, though, because they don't exist. No, don't send one of those. You'll get Kev all angry. Um, so, uh, yes, please keep sending your your, uh, your questions into the show, and we'll be answering those. Uh, our thanks to uh, Charles Brooks this week for those, uh, well, for his, his conversation and those incredible pictures. Kev's just off now to go find a, a probe lens, aren't you, Kev? Huh? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, thank you to Please those. Up to Charles. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to those of our friends who support us on Patreon. Music from Blue Wednesday, supporting music from the incredible Artlist.io. We will see you next week. Bye bye, Kev. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. The Fujicast is an independent loading zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.